50,000 feet into the ionosphere, winds pushed the ash east into communities like Yakima, turning Sunday noon into the dead of night. Residents were issued gas masks and sent respiratory patients to hospitals. Cars stalled on the streets when the dense ash stopped up carburetors and air filters, and police told everybody just to stay in the homes. We have a number of reports tonight. David Jackson is right now at the base of Mount St. Helens. David, what's happening? Well, Richard, as we've been telling you all day, the mountain, of course, in its largest eruption ever, and tonight, as we speak here at 6 o'clock, it has subsided somewhat although this is not too much different than the mountain looked when we first arrived this morning. We got here a little bit after 10 o'clock, and as you can see behind me right now, the uh, primary eruption going off to the east-northeast there, and then we do have that eruptive material down what is the northwest face of the mountain, and that is a little different color ash and smoke going down in the direction in the vicinity of Spirit Lake, and we'll have stories later uh, in the newscast about what's going on over on that side of the mountain. What I'd like to do for a moment is take you back to the beginning of the time that we arrived up here, which was a little bit after 10 o'clock this morning, as I mentioned. The mountain looked somewhat like it does right now, but then we saw some massive pluming that took place about then. I think we have a tape here taking a look at it that uh, that was again about, I think this was about 10.30 this morning when we first arrived. There was also lightning off to the right-hand side of the mountain as we looked at it. That is off to the uh, eastern, uh, looking east from the peak itself. By 12.15, the eruption changed, and this is information that I got from the U.S. Geological Survey. The ash changed more to what we're looking at tonight, a more of a light gray sort of a color, rather than the earlier blacker ash that uh, came out. There was also some steam at that time, and that's also when we first started noticing some of the uh, mud and snow slides that went down the sides of the peak, primarily to the uh, Spirit Lake side, the northwest side, and also to the eastern side of the peak, as we looked at it here from the south. At one point, this was at about uh, 1 o'clock, we had a situation, or no, actually a little bit later than that, maybe toward 3 o'clock, we had a situation where the entire mountain from our vantage point here looked almost as the top does now with the, the tall plumes of smoke uh, moving all the way up from the base of it, all the way from the timberline area because uh, the mud flows had, had gone that far down the peak, particularly off to the right and left-hand side of the screen as we looked at it here. Again, we were not in a place uh, to make any technical observations. We didn't see the uh, mud flows going into the reservoirs or the rivers, although there was a lot of that activity on the far side of the mountain. What we did learn was that the Swift Creek Reservoir side, that's here on the south, was not too terribly hit by it, although mud flows might have reached that far. At least we didn't get any word of any serious damage in that area. That's the, the Cougar Washington area, which is uh, just ahead of us here between where we are and the mountain itself. We had another uh, large eruption that took place at about 4.30, and uh, that was, that was a, sort of a blasting effect that was lifting ash way up into the uh, sky and then depositing it back on top. And if we're back on our live picture here, you can see, and when we do take a look at it, the very top of the peak is rimmed with sort of a light-colored ash, and that is sort of a result of that, a lot of the ash that then dropped right straight back down onto the top of the peak. That's the latest from here, Richard. As you can see, it is a good bit quieter than it was earlier today from some of the pictures we've been looking at. And uh, again, a lot of that activity trailing off there to the Spirit Lake side, and I know you have more on that. All right, thank you, David. Of course, it was not just awe-inspiring, but it had a lot of devastating impact, right, Robin? It did indeed, and despite the advance planning, things did go wrong just after the eruption, catching hundreds by surprise. Every available source of emergency transportation is being pressed into service to help the injured, rescue the lost, and carry out the dead. Death and damage is heaviest along the banks of the Toodle River, as Tim Storrs reports. Following the Toodle River to its source is to follow a path of destruction. This warehouser lumber camp, Camp Baker, was destroyed by the first of two waves of mud and water pouring down the canyon from the mountain. The flood water sweeping through the valley picked up tons of logging equipment and logs, throwing them across the river, knocking over a stand of fur, and covering three quarters of the camp with mud. Railroad tracks are buried along with the road on the north side of the river. The bridge over the Toodle River, just downstream from this camp, was washed away. An Amtrak bridge further downriver is closed, damaged by the flood of water, mud, and logs smashing into it. Warehouser spokesmen say all their crews are accounted for. 
But not everyone was that lucky at this camp. The 304th Air Rescue Squadron from Portland is evacuating residents and workers from areas close to the mountain. At least five people are known dead, apparently trapped in their cars, either by flooding or the gases that swept through the camp during the first pyroclastic flow, literally a river of ash and gas. On highways 504 and 505, sightseers, homeowners, along with police and some chopper pilots needed first aid themselves, overcome by toxic gas blowing from the volcano. There are still several other people unaccounted for, including federal workers doing survey work, and of course, Harry Truman, the crusty old caretaker of Spirit Lake Lodge. There is no confirmed word on the lodge, the lake, or Truman, but National Geographic personnel near the area today during the eruption say there is no sign of the lodge anymore, and that the lake, quote, appears to be boiling. It is impossible to say just exactly what changes have taken place on top of the mountain because it is hidden alternately by clouds of steam and by ash spewing from the mountaintop. But undoubtedly, they will be profound and extensive. Airborne near Mount St. Helens with photographer Jeff Olson and sound tech D. Dixon. Tim Storrs, Channel 2 News. The Toodle River flooded twice today as walls of water crashed down the Toodle River Valley late this, this morning and again this afternoon. Now, Channel 2's Paul Hansen just got back from the Cla Castle Rock area. Paul, what is the chain of events? What's the sequence there? Well, Robin, a mudslide caused that first flash flood along the Toodle River, sending a log jam a mile and a half long crashing through the Toodle River Valley. The wall of water was estimated at 20 feet high in some places. The logs apparently ended up in the river after that flash flood roared through that warehouse or lumber camp near the town of Tootle. Washington State Police had Interstate 5 blocked off for about four, four and a half hours late this morning and through the afternoon, afraid, of course, that the flood would destroy the bridge on Interstate 5 over the Tootle River. It did not. Police reopened the interstate freeway at about 3.30 this afternoon to traffic, although there are uh, numerous police cars in that area. A second flash flood on the Tootle was expected late this afternoon. It apparently was not as big and will not be as big as that early morning flood. The afternoon flooding was caused by a break up at Shoestring Glacier, which dropped into Pine Creek and the Green River. Several bridges on the Tootle River along the Spirit Lake Highway were reported destroyed as well. The Tootle right now looks like a giant mud hole with a thick, soupy texture and a lot of debris and logs and junk, if to, for lack of a better word, in that river. Of course, the flooding and the mud flows will take a heavy toll on fish life in that river. An estimated 120 families were evacuated from the town of Tootle, as were the residents of a juvenile facility near that town. As could be expected, police had their hands more than full, trying to keep the freeway closed this morning and the afternoon, and then trying to keep the sightseers away from the Tootle River. We understand uh, that the police failed at, uh, in some cases, trying to keep people away. They were able to uh, get around the roadblocks, and despite the warnings to stay out of that very dangerous area, some people decided to go in anyway. Now, as we've reported, at least five people died following the eruption of Mount St. Helens. Authorities had Highway 504 blocked off at Castle Rock. They were trying to keep those sightseers and curious folks away. One man who said he lives near the mountain, north of it actually, pulled into a gas station at Castle Rock, thankful that he was able to get out of the area alive. Car tracks and I saw evidence of, uh, I mean, I could see a pickup before it happened in the same area. You said you were in total darkness? Yes, for about two and a half hours. As the man mentioned, he uh, was in total darkness for two and a half hours. Th this is a picture now of his vehicle, and that's uh, a covering of thick ash all over the uh, vehicle and uh, up on the hood, which we saw just a moment ago. Uh, it was about an inch thick. Now, we were prevented uh, from getting uh, near Spirit Lake or Camp Baker on the ground, obviously. Well, at the Highway 504 roadblock, we heard one College County Sheriff's deputy on the radio describe the Camp Baker area as looking like it had been hit by an atom bomb blast. If you uh, don't have any need to be in that area, please stay away. It's very dangerous up there. Nothing, nothing uh, fancy about it. It's uh, just not a place to be at all. I imagine that those, uh, those cautions will remain up indefinitely at this point. Yes, at this point there are Washington State uh, police officers and Collins County authorities uh, in, near the town of Castle Rock. They have Highway 504 and we understand 503 blocked off. Now late this afternoon, at about uh, three thirty, four o'clock, we also heard another radio transmission from a Collins County deputy saying that near the intersection of Washington State Highway 504 and 503, and that would be uh, a, a little bit north and east uh, of uh, Tootle, rather south and east of Tootle, that uh, people were 
having problems breathing because of the volcanic ash and gas in that area. So please stay away from that area. The police have the roadblocks there, and they, they certainly have their hands full. They don't need any more problems. Thank you very much, Paul. It's history in the making with all the tragedy and wonder of nature. We'll be back with further documentation. Stay with us. Well, Mount St. Helens was up with the sun this morning, putting the kind of show on that uh, comes only once in a century. Channel 2's Essex Porter flew in close to the mountain, uh, close to the exploding peak. He has a story. Going early this morning, and by midday it seemed as if an atomic bomb had gone off inside. A thick plume of ash, smoke, and steam was spewing tens of thousands of feet in the air. At times, the eruption seemed to taper off a bit, but then the continuous explosions grew stronger and stronger. It's hard to know how much of the top of the mountain is gone now. Before this eruption, geologists estimated the diameter of the crater at 600 feet. Now maybe it's 2,000 or more feet wide. Throughout the day, St. Helens has been making her own weather, streaks of lightning shooting from the plume, striking the top of the crater. And then as the day went on, a crown of clouds covered the crest. A thick ash cloud blew to the northeast, the high-level winds keeping most of the material aloft while some of the heavier particles settled like a fog over the hills below. As always, the mountain is keeping her own counsel. The eruptions have been growing in strength during much of the day, and no one can predict when they will stop. Flying over Mount St. Helens, Essex Porter reporting, Channel 2 News. There is no simple way to describe what we are witnessing. Every adjective, every superlative applies. From the sky within an hour after the explosive eruption, this is what it looked like. The column of ash and steam is solid and dense. Lightning bolts are visible from time to time, striking the mountaintop and lighting the center of the column. Portland State University geologist Tom Benson was aboard this flight and describes what we saw. Uh, like this is uh, ten times anything we've seen, at least. Can you tell if there's been any change on the top of the mountain? Yes, a good deal of the top of the mountain is gone. What part of it? You're talking uh, about Shoestring Glacier on the north I side facing Portland? Well, all of Shoestring Glacier, certainly. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how far down toward Goat Box it's gone, but let's put it this way. I think the crater has probably at least tripled in size, and probably that's this morning. Is this the big explosion everybody's been waiting for? Uh, this is the first big explosion that we've seen, yeah. Uh, that's not to eliminate out the possibility of more. Uh, I don't, we really don't know at this point. The state patrol, early in the day, within minutes after the flash flood announcement was made, closed off Interstate 5 and other highways into the area. And this is why. This wave of debris, logs, slash, and mud from a warehouser camp on the north side of the mountain was washed away. A solid mass of material, at least a mile long, plunging down the Tootle River. Further upriver, observers estimated the height of the wave to be at least 12 feet. But by the time the floodwaters had reached this part of the river, near Castle Rock, the river widened, allowing the force of the flood to be diffused. The logs piled up around the base of bridge columns and stacked up in bends of the river. The level of the water, without doubt, rose, bringing water to the back doors of some homes and cabins along the river. Bridges along the upper reaches of it are buried, the bridges along the lower reaches holding up. This may or may not be the big explosion that geologists have been predicting. It is at least the biggest eruption since the initial eruption of the mountain last March 27th. Airborne near Mount St. Helens, Tim Storrs reporting, Channel 2 News. Yakima, Washington is in total darkness tonight. It's been that way all day. The pictures you're about to see were taken at noon today. Ash fallout is extreme. Nearly three inches of black soot covers everything, and it's still coming down. The warning is out tonight for people with breathing problems. Stay inside. There's also worry about contamination of water there. Many people are already drinking bottled water. When Channel 2 News returns, we'll have geologist Tom Benson from Portland State University on the set with us for a live interview. Stay with us. Tom Benson, geologist for Portland State University, is on the set with us now for an interview. He's been following this as closely as we have, and we're becoming close friends at this point. Tom, what, what is the definitive statement right now on that mountain? Um, we haven't had confirmed reports of lava flows. What's, as far as you can estimate, what are we looking at here? I think we're looking at a much larger scale of ash eruption than we've seen before. Uh, I, until I see a confirmed report, uh, I will not be believe any report of any lava flows. But you would say that it's very possible and likely, perhaps? I would say it's very certainly very possible, yes. What about the seismic activity we've been seeing up there? Um, I understand that it made a good mark on your machine today, bigger than, than perhaps we've seen before. Uh, yes, actually, uh, as near as we can tell, it was a uh, 
Richter magnitude 5 quake coming in about 8.30 this morning, uh, and then probably followed a minute later by another one, so it looks really quite spectacular on the seismic record. It's greater than 5 point, you believe? Uh, probably right on 5 point or just above. To give the public some gauge about the severity of a 5 point quake or above? Uh, certainly it would be felt within a reasonable radius, say that is uh, 10 miles or so of the mountain, and certainly if you were anywhere near the mountain, yes. Well, we can see right there the marks that that's made. Now, oh, yes. what, what time is this? Uh, it was um, 8.32 8 uh, and 28 seconds where it was received. It I was see. And is this continuous? Uh, it'll go on now for about three or four minutes, uh, and probably the second one is starting to come in right about there. Mm -hmm. And it's awfully hard to disentangle these two. What is the activity now, do you know? Uh, it's continuing, but not at this higher rate. Uh, on the seismic activity. Now the eruptive activity is going on, this was the first major eruption, uh, and it's going on pretty much constantly, I'd say, if I had to try to describe it. There's been a lot of talk about the gases in the air and the fact that they, you know, they are toxic. We're talking about chloride and uh, sulfur. Mm -hmm. What is that situation? Uh, again, that is very hard to uh, tell from the uh, reports we've gotten. I think anybody who gets near there is going to smell sulfur. There is sulfur involved. The question is how much of it's involved, mm -hmm. and whether it's that uh, that's or just the ash itself that's uh, triggering these gas reports. Uh, so far, uh, I, they haven't confirmed any reports of large quantities of gas. Tom, what are the dangers connected with this? What are the dangers connected with the ash? What are the dangers connected with the gas? Uh, the dangers connected with the gas are fairly obvious. Uh, you don't. You're supposed to be breathing oxygen, not uh, yeah. sulfur dioxide. Yeah. Uh, the prime danger really is with uh, mud flows, uh -huh. which are melting snow and ash that's falling on the snow, just sort of sweeping down the mountainside and literally filling the valley. Spirit Lake is because formed by a mud flow dam that happened a few hundred years ago. Now, when that, when that ash is, is on the ground, uh, just the falling ash, uh, that's not going to turn into something that's, that's uh, going to eat into your clothing or no, burn no, your skin. No, or no it'll like turn that. very slightly as a chemist would certainly be able to notice it, but I doubt if the uh, average person on the street would. Uh, the bigger danger there is a sort of the smothering effect of the ash on plants and things like that. And how about wildlife? In but it's not going to do the wildlife any good for sure. Yeah. And, you know, ingest it into your lungs, but you're, you're inhaling uh, tiny uh, glass or glassy particles if you want, and that's not particularly good for your lungs. Putting this in a little bit into perspective, Mount Lassen, California, 1914 was when it began its erupted, eruptive period. Is there a comparison? Uh, that's a little hard to make uh, because Lassen, of course, did erupt lava mm -hmm. uh, at the end in 1915. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing has uh, happened like that yet on St. Helens. Uh, my offhand guess is the, uh, the St. Helens eruption is following a somewhat larger course than the St. Helens, than the, than the last eruption. Do you mean more severe? Uh, yes, but we haven't seen any lava yet, so uh, the, the big blast eruption that really took out a big chunk of the north side of, or northeast side of Lassen, um, we haven't seen anything quite like that. Would you venture um, an opinion as to whether we could see that? Uh, that one is very difficult to answer. If we could see that kind of thing, um, yes. Uh, we haven't yet. Uh, the magma, this type, the switching into this phase of activity that we see says that the magma is getting fairly close to the surface. We're in a very violent eruptive period on that mountain. Will it continue, do you think? Yes, I think it will. For yes. how long? Well, um, certainly I would say we're looking at days. And that, frankly, is a bit of a gasp. So it's going to be kind of a kind of a tense week around here, right? I would think so, yes. Okay, thank you. We've got some more information on the mountain from Kim Gilbert in the newsroom. Kim? Thank you, Richard. I have an update report here. The Washington State Patrol says that the water rushing down the Toodle River now has a third wall. We've shown you two so far. This is just in. We'll have pictures for you on that later. We'll try to. So it's very dangerous, and of course, everybody in there is uh, working hard to keep things as under control as they can. Two of three men fishing near Morton, Washington, which is in Lewis County, this morning when St. Helens Blue are now in the Joseph's Hospital, St. Joseph's Hospital in Tacoma, they received 
second degree burns over their bodies this morning from chunks of that falling hot ash. They jumped into the lake to avoid any further damage to themselves and the hot ash completely flattened their pickup truck and it stripped and leveled trees throughout that entire area. A third man who was with them fishing is missing and a search is underway for him at this time. The two are reported in stable condition. They first went to the general hospital in Morton and then they were transferred to St. Joseph's up in Tacoma. And as it stands now, 2,000 people have been evacuated, most of them from Palama Tootle and the Lewis River areas. The town of Cougar also has been totally evacuated. Most of these people tonight are in the Ridgeland Grange Hall and Cascade Junior High School in Longview. Emergency crews are also preparing the Lewis County Fairgrounds for any other evacuees that may come or need help. The Humane Society wants to announce that the Cowlitz County area in Longview is accepting any animals who need shelter as a result of Mount St. Helens and they're receiving food supplies from King County Humane Society and a crew will be on standby for 24 hours and they have a phone number that they'd like you to call if you need any help it's 577-0151 and uh, we also say that uh, burn victims some burn victims are on their way to Emanuel we'll have a full report for you uh, as soon as we can Richard all right, thank you, Kim. Now, up next, Fred Jenkins with a weather forecast and how the mountain is affecting the weather. Well, this mountain is going to affect our weather. I have a feeling, Fred, is it going to... It hasn't affected any uh, us here in Portland. No, mo most of the effects, Richard, will be downstream. That is from the uh, east to the northeast of the mountain. In fact, some of the changes already, you know, some of the effects already, has been uh, almost a continuous thunderstorm for the past four or five hours in uh, Yakima, where they continue to have quite a bit of ash fallout. In fact, at this hour, they have a third of an inch of ash on the ground at that point, and other stations uh, in the eastern Washington are reporting accumulation of ash all also, we have a uh, graphic here that shows the general area of ash fallout uh, a couple of hours ago, extending from the mountain, of course, and then toward the northeast, up to and including Spokane. In fact, at this hour, uh, ash is being reported falling in and around Omak, uh, Wenatchee, Ephrata. Yakima continues to have ash fallout, as does Geiger Field up in Spokane. And the uh, general wind flow will is has already, that is, taken it into the uh, central portions of uh, northern uh, Idaho. I have not had any reports from Moscow, but uh, we do have confirmed reports that some light ash has been reported in and around the Lewiston area. Ash earlier this afternoon being uh, reported falling in the Pullman area, so it's very likely that Moscow, Idaho, has had some. The uh, conditions uh, as far as the upper wind flow will con is concerned will continue to drive that thing toward the northeast. Let's take a look at the satellite picture. It quite uh, clearly outlines the plume itself. It's the darker area through the uh, central portions of uh, Washington, uh, heading into the northern and, and uh, central portions of Idaho, heading also into the western portions of Montana. This whole area is the outline of the plume. It's beginning to bend down a little bit due to the upper wind flow heading down toward the northeastern sections of Wyoming. There's a traveler's advisory out all the way from the Cascade Passes for the entire eastern sections of uh, Washington. The guys over in Idaho are now are, uh, forecasting the possibility of ash fallout in the northern and central portions of Idaho. And there is even a very slight possibility that some of that ash may occur in the uh, extreme northeastern sections of Oregon. Although I talked to Pendleton uh, not too long ago, the guys out in Pendleton, they had not had anything falling in that area, but the skies were very dark toward the north of their station. Walla Walla was reporting a uh, lowering of the ceiling as that uh, ash plume came into the area. The general upper wind flow pattern will continue to direct uh, most of the uh, fallout or most of the pollutants with this uh, plume into the uh, northern sections of the uh, United States and then moving down into a trough. It will not surprise me very much at all if we start receiving reports from um, Wyoming in that area as far as ash fall out in the next day or so. Temperature here at the studios, we're still a warm, muggy 77 degrees. That's in fact uh, the hot spot or the hot temperature for the day. The freezing level all the way up to 11,100 feet. I, 75 was the high as of 5 o'clock, however, it has increased to 70, uh, 7, 74 and 76 the highs in Eugene. Temperatures along the coast in the upper 50s and 60s. East of the Cascades, temperatures generally in the 70s, except uh, the Dells did manage a high today of 80. And the high in Yakima, due to the cloud cover, the, the uh, pollutant cover there, was only 64 degrees today. The forecast along the coast, uh, 
calls for generally mostly cloudy conditions. I'm talking general, for the most part middle and higher clouds. Some afternoon clearing, 55 to 65 will be the highs. The valley will be mostly cloudy through Tuesday with highs between 65 and 70. Variable cl higher clouds in the Cascades, freezing level e at least 8 to 10,000 feet. The gorge is going to be mostly cloudy tomorrow and Tuesday, highs 70 to 80. East of the Cascades, variable clouds and again, a chance of light ash fallout in the northeastern section of the state, the extreme northeastern sections of Oregon. 75 to 80 for the most part will be the highs and for Portland and Vancouver, mostly cloudy through Tuesday, the high 70, the overnight low 51, south and westerly winds at about 5 to 15. And with this continued westerly, that is from west to east, uh, there's very little likelihood of any real fallout here in the Portland area at this point. All right, thank you, Fred. There were some other things happening today. Uh, a lot of sports fans were unhappy with these frequent reports on the mountain. Yeah, uh, but Bill Billoy is going to fill us in, right? <laughs> Richard, we did get a lot of phone calls today. I really don't understand it because a soccer match in Tampa, Florida, rather inconsequential when you compare it to what's happening just, just north of Portland here. Anyway, this evening on Channel 2 Sports, we will have highlights of that off-interrupted soccer tilt, a feature report on a former Beaver pitcher now throwing for the other guys, and Al Wynn will highlight last night's national championship volleyball matches. Details are coming up next. Before we get to the sports news, another report from Amboy Washington and David Jackson concerning some of the damage from this eruption. David? All right, Richard, as you mentioned, primarily not a report from this location, but one on the damage that uh, took place downstream along the Toodle River. Right now, the situation behind me, again, a little bit quieter than it had been. Cartographers, I think, around the nation are going to have to get out their erasers. The top 500 to 1,000 feet of the mountain is completely gone, as you can tell much, much lower summit than it used to be. I want to get into this tape right away. Paul Majors and cameraman Carl Wickman were in a helicopter. They just got back a moment ago from the Toodle River area, and we have some very dramatic pictures of the new Toodle River, or what it looks like. This is uh, downstream from Spirit Lake, down along the Toodle River, where the river actually carved an entirely new path for itself. This is the second wave of mud that went downstream along with all these enormous logs that you're looking at right here, some raw pictures, and there are the trees dropping along the way, and this is uh, various areas along what was the original bank of the Toodle River, and mainly the log jams, well, of course, along with the mud, knocking down just hundreds of trees along the way. This is the area where the five people were killed along Camp Baker, and around Camp Baker. We did get late word from Weyerhaeuser that those five people are not were not warehouser employees, but we do not have word on who exactly they were. That area there uh, was uh, completely devastated and there was a lot of equipment loss and everything. There's a good shot of a big tree falling down along the banks of the Toodle River, which is now, of course, much, much larger and had, had uh, diverted itself off in various directions with this new mud flow. Uh, the, the road going alongside of it uh, being covered up in many locations with the mud and the trees as they were washed down there from the Camp Baker area. There, in fact, is Camp Baker. A good look at the devastation there with uh, the trees piled up alongside the equipment. There are some shots of the trucks that were taken from the helicopter. This is just moments ago. They just arrived back here at this location. This is where the five people were killed, and there's a very dramatic view overhead of Camp Baker, the Weyerhaeuser camp along the Toodle River, and all that debris that's been deposited right in there. Overturned trucks, and really just a an enormous mess along the Camp Baker area. That again, the second mud flow, the second mud flow to come from the mountain, the first one a little bit earlier, and in fact not quite as devastating as that. The word that we had was shoestring glacier along the top of the mountain at that point had melted and formed this mud flow and then forged its way down the Toodle River. Those are the pictures we wanted to get to you, Richard, just before going into sports. Thank you, David. And adequate adjectives just fail you as you watch that awesome destructive power of nature just doesn't feel right now to talk baseball, does it? Let's talk about something lighter for a minute. Okay, here we go. First of all, the Portland Beavers, they're back to within one half game of first place Tacoma in the PCL North. The Beavers beat the Tigers 4-1 to this afternoon. Pasquale Perez going a distance. He allowed five hits. Tacoma wins that series three games to two. Well, the five-game series marked the return of right-hander Eric Wilkins to the Rose City. Two seasons ago, Wilkins was a fixture here, leading the Pacific Coast League with a record of 15-5. and five. He spent the entire 1979 season in the majors, pitching for Cleveland. His record stood at two wins, four losses when an elbow injury sidelined the fi fireballer for the rest of the season. Just kept throwing on it. Really didn't know when I heard it and, and kept throwing on it. And it got a little bit more irritated to where it just um, would hurt to go past three or four innings. And luckily I caught it in time that I didn't need any surgery and uh, set out the end of that year and 
the whole winter and, and came back in spring training, you know, pretty strong. That, that kind of messed up their plans because they, they had made a lot of trades for some other pitchers, and, you know, it kind of, kind of shifted me out because of that. Wilkins is philosophical about his demotion. Although confident he could contribute positively to a weak Cleveland team, he's willing to make the most of another season in the minors. I'm sure I'll get back up there sooner or later. I'm in no rush. Right now, I guess the best thing is that uh, I'm getting paid, and these guys are about to go on strike pretty soon, I, from what I can hear still. And um, I'd rather be here when that happens. Thursday, Wilkins was the winning pitcher in Tacoma's 11-4 victory over the Beavers. His record, 4-2. and two. He leads the league in strikeouts. Barring another injury, a career in the bigs appears a certainty, either in Cleveland or somewhere else, like his native Seattle. Out of college, I wanted to get drafted by the Mariners bad, you know, real bad, but um, they didn't see me in their plans. And um, it's a little early for me to be worrying about getting traded. I really just want to get to the big leagues and, and show some people what I can do. And then if I need to be traded, then I, I'm sure the other teams will They'll see my talents and, and decide to trade for me, or if Cleveland doesn't think I have the talent, then they'll get rid of me. Meanwhile, a walkout by Major League players appears a certainty. Today's, today's negotiations broke off. Old Harry Truman. There is no evidence that Truman left the mountain prior to this latest turn of events. I last saw Harry about two weeks ago. It was one of many inter afternoons we'd spent together. Harry talks faster and in greater amount than anybody I've ever met, and our topics of conversation ranged from politics to prohibition to, of course, his love for the mountain. But what few people know is that it's Harry's love for his wife that keeps him on that mountain. She died five years ago. Mrs. Truman was 15 years his junior. When when they wed, a city girl who most of Harry's friends thought would never adapt to the life on the mountain. She did adapt, and the two lived out their married lives at Spirit Lake. This is where they spent their final days together, and for that reason, Harry remains. <laughs> no, I'm not going to leave. You're damn right I'm not going to leave. I'm going to stay here. If I left, it'd kill me. If I left this place and lost my home, I'd die in a week. I, I couldn't live. I couldn't, I couldn't extend it. So I'm like that old captain. I'm, by God, I'm going down the ship. I said, if the damn thing takes this mountain, I'm going along with it. I'd rather be dead for than to live without it. <laughs> that crazy? Damn stupid, huh? Okay. The people see that, they say the craziest man in God's real world is old Truman. We've just re received this late uh, word from sheriff's deputies who say 30 feet of mud are covering the Spirit Lake area. Channel 2 News has made two attempts to reach Spirit Lake. We were forced back by the heavy asphalt. We will try again. Sheriff's deputies have no alternative at this point but to assume that Harry was up there when it happened and he didn't make it out. Richard? Some other property owners in the Spirit Lake area are probably breathing a small sigh of relief tonight. Just yesterday, a number of Spirit Lake cabin and homeowners gathered at Tootle School with the help of the Washington State Patrol and uh, Cowlitz and Skamania County Sheriff's deputies. That group planned on visiting their property around the lake. Governor Ray's position on this is that she wants to be of some assistance to the property owners and, and let you go in and, and at your own risk and take care of whatever you have to take care of. And she's directed us to be allowed to deviate from the executive order for the purpose of allowing some of the property owners to go in and we've been directed to assist you in doing that. After a 30-minute ride to the danger area, property owners filled out waivers, releasing the county from li uh, liability while the group was in the area around Mount St. Helens. Most of the owners were eager to sign those release forms. How would you feel? You want to see we're, we're paying taxes and we would, we'd like to use our property. I'm not afraid. It's not just property to us, it's our home. And we've lived there a long time and we've seen all kinds of conditions on this road and on that mountain, and I feel that our, our home is safe, and I'd like to be able to go back. Well, most of those property owners were able to get back in and take out what they needed to take out and make uh, final preparations for just what happened today, and obviously it was in the, in the nick of time. The eruption of Mount St. Helens, of course, is history in the making. Less than two months ago, it was a beautiful snow-capped mountain. Now it's covered with ash and mud. And David Jackson put together a profile of Mount St. Helens. Here is that report. 
It was only six weeks ago on the 25th of March when Stan Wilson was sent to the mountain to report on the quickening pace of earthquakes rocking the peak. Seismograph equipment had been placed in locations around the mountain by the U.S. Geological Survey to measure the quakes which remained in the three to four point range on the Richter scale. There were hundreds of the slight quakes each day. Scientists agreed that the activity was sure to lead to volcanic activity and we did not have long to wait. Under dense cloud cover, the mountain blew at 1237 on Thursday, March the 27th. The first volcanic activity in the continental United States since 1915. Forest Service planes spotted the smoke and quickly the news media had planes viewing the eruption from above the clouds. It was not until that Sunday that the public actually got to see what the mountain had done. The clean, pristine white of Mount St. Helens had been dusted with a fine volcanic ash. This, uh, this eruption provides an incredible opportunity for geologists and other scientists who have been studying the uh, Cascade volcanoes. Uh, there has been a project uh, sponsored by the U.S. Geological Survey to research the deposits left by earlier eruptions, uh, particularly at Mount St. Helens. But this is the first time anyone has actually observed an eruption, and we can learn the duration uh, the, the content, the gases emitted, of course, which are long gone by the time a geologist studies a layer. And what is particularly interesting about Mount St. Helens is that it is a volcano of incredible variety. For the next few days, the mountain threw out not only steam, smoke, and ash, but huge chunks of rock and ice. There were even reports of blue flames from the peak. Channel 2's Bill Van Amberg was one who saw the flames at night from Spirit Lake. And of course, at Spirit Lake, Harry Truman was holding his ground. The eruptions fell into a pattern as the top of the peak was transformed. A huge crater opened as the mountain cleared its throat. Over 1,700 feet across, this was the first dramatic change in the top of the mountain and began a process that's continuing to this day. As the eyes of the world focused in on the southern Washington peak, it immediately went into hiding. Spring weather in the Cascades got as much coverage as the mountain because everyone was frustrated by hail, rain, and snow. I was one who spent many uncomfortable hours watching in the rain from nearby Amboy. But after the clouds passed, the real show began. As clear weather and two weeks of regular eruptions brought crowds from all over the west coast. And this is when the cracking at the top of the peak was noticed. As the huge crater expanded, the deep glaciers and snowpack began to give way some to be swallowed into the gaping hole, and some, dangerously, to slide down the expanding flanks of the peak. Most noticeably, the north face grew, and the danger from slides was most severe there on the Spirit Lake side. But still, Harry Truman remained. After the spectacular eruption period, the mountain entered a more dormant state. I have no reason to believe that this eruption won't continue in some stage or other, intermittently perhaps for years, or judging by the last time it happened, maybe decades. Again, even the experts could not pin down a meaning for the activity or the lack of activity, and no one knew if lava would ever spill from the crater. To us, with attention riveted to the mountain, the wait seemed endless, and interest actually waned. But the mountain is not yet through. Just the dark mountain with a significant new bulge on the north flank, one that had grown during the quiet period, and suggested that the long-awaited lava may be pushing upward. And now, as attention and scrutiny again scan Mount St. Helens, we can clearly see that the once friendly, steady, solid piece of northwest landscape is now a very much altered mountain, one that continues to blast forth its volcanic power and heave and groan with a movement that still may bring molten lava to the surface and usher in a new round of man's study and wonderment at the changing face of the planet. David remains close to this story as the events unfold. He's at our Amboy microwave site, which is about 10 miles south of the mountain. David, what's the situation now? I think the first thing I'll do is add to the end of that piece that uh was mentioned there certainly a changing face indeed 500 feet maybe miss has uh, disappeared from the top of the peak and I mentioned a big crater opening in the top and everybody knew of course about that earlier and now of course a much much larger one I think it's interesting to note right now that uh, there is there must be some kind of new opening on that what had been the expanding northern flank of the mountain because as we look right now behind me you can see that the eruption is in two 
distinct phases. We have the main one there at the top, and then, of course, another similar ash eruption that's taking place to the left-hand side of the screen looking that way, and, of course, that other kind of uh, plume that kind of drifts down to what used to be, apparently, the Spirit Lake area. But as you can clearly see in the picture right now, we do have a, uh, a large eruption that is coming up from that uh, angle over there on the northern slope of the mountain. Another thing we wanted to mention again before we left was the problems that have been caused by the ash and smoke drifting off to the north-northeast. The town of Yakima was completely darkened today. The sun blotted out by the ash as it drifted that direction. We have some pictures of Yakima that were taken earlier, and there they are. Street lights on, cars with their headlights on, and really an incredible condition. That's about 80 miles from the peak, so as you can determine that the, uh, the drift of that ash was, was really remarkable that far away, and of course it's gone all the way into Idaho, but very dark in Yakima as we look at it right now. Uh, those pictures were taken at about 1 or 2 o'clock this afternoon by a crew uh, in Yakima. Back live right now, and as I mentioned, the uh, important thing there, a look at the uh, plume that's developing over on that northern flank of the mountain, the eruption continuing. Still just reports of lava, not anything confirmed that I've heard yet. You might have a final word on that, I'm not sure. But from here, we'll stand by. The weather has cleared, and we should have a good view of, of the mountain tonight as it continues to erupt. David, I'm not certain about this, but is that plume changing direction at all? It appears it's going over to the right more than it was earlier. I think it's drifting probably the same way as the, as the main plume, if that's the, the gist of your question there. It's uh, possibly drifting a little bit more to the north, but it's certainly an entirely new opening that we've got on the mountain right now. It's interesting, those wide shots, David. They're so wide, it almost looks like a still picture behind you. If you have a, you have to look at it very closely, and that's true, we've noticed that all day. It does look like a still picture, but the more you stare at the top there, the more you can see those plumes billowing forth. All and right. uh, an incredible view. Thank you very much, David. Okay. Well, the eruption we have feared, but we still secretly hoped would come on Mount St. Helens, started this morning an awe-inspiring and frightening story, a story that has just begun and will stay on top of it. We'll have a full report tonight at 11.30.